Historicism is the belief that was held by the majority of the Protestant reformers, including Martin Luther, John Calvin, Thomas Cranmer, and John Knox. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church tried to counter it with an alternate view, such as that put forward by the Jesuit Francisco Ribera during its counter-reformation. This alternate view served to bolster the Catholic Church position against Protestant criticism and as a Catholic defense against the historicist view, which identifies the Roman Church as a persecuting apostasy and the papacy as the seat of the Antichrist. Presently, most of the evangelical and Christian world believe some version of the futurist Catholic Counter-Reformation view of prophecy. The historicist interpretation reveals the entire course of history of the Church from the close of the first century to the end of time, which must necessarily be revised as new events and figures emerge on the world scene. This series is an up-to-date outline of the historicist view of the Revelation. Lecture 18, The Covenant Angels' Commission, Ecclesiastical Reformation of the Ministry and the Church, Revelation 10, 8 through 11. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and I said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 11, 1 and 2 And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. In this passage we have prefigured the two great steps of advance in the Reformation. First, the recommissioning by Christ of faithful spiritually prepared ministers to preach his gospel in various countries and languages. Next, the authorized constitution of the evangelical and reformed church to the exclusion of the apostate church of Rome. 1. The first is contained in the charge to St. John in his representative character to take and eat the little book which the angel delivered to him, and so to go forth as the Lord's ambassador and preacher to all people. The word prophesy too frequently understood only in its restricted meaning of predicting future events, has far more significance. Both in Hebrew and in Greek the term implies to tell forth, announce, speak as an ambassador. Thus, it includes the making known God's mind and will, the explanation of his mysteries, the pleading his cause, and in this, the exhorting, instructing, reproving, warning, and reason with a rebellious people. In the New Testament, the same meaning is attached to it, and it is specially applied by St. Paul to the expounding the written scriptures and exhorting from them. This general signification of preaching the gospel is that which is here intended and made clear from the symbolic act connected with it the taking up and digesting the little book as the subject matter of that preaching, just as in the parallel instruction given by the Lord to the prophet Ezekiel, as also in the case of Jeremiah. The little book, in the present instance, was the doctrine committed by Jesus to his disciples, 
the New Testament, which they were to preach to every creature, and which injunction, both as to reading and expounding amongst heathen and Christian congregations, continued to be observed for three centuries as the constant part of Christian Sabbath worship, until, in the progress of time, the professed church could no longer endure sound doctrine, and, as they departed from the faith, discontinued the practice. At the end of some 400 years, Christianity, as we know, became nominally the religion of Christendom. Two centuries later, the Goths, who had invaded as heathen or Arians, settled down into Orthodox Christianity. Thus, the world was in outward profession identified with the Church. And what then followed? By degrees, the scripture lessons were abridged. Legends of saints were introduced in the place of the Bible. The Psalms, the chief scripture lessons remaining, were chanted by the priests instead of being read to the people. And as language changed, owing to the intermixture of the Goths with the Romans, the services, being in Latin, were no longer understood. Preaching also became rare. For though to certain of the deacons and presbyters in the cities permission to that effect was given, yet was it considered that the obligation appertained only to the bishop. Consequently, the bulk of rural population was left in ignorance. Homilies from the early fathers, translated by the bishop or other more learned person, were for a while enjoined to be used instead of sermons. But even these were after a while neglected, besides which a restriction was imposed on the free preaching of the gospel, no presbyter being allowed to preach unless expressly authorized by the bishop. And further, even bishops being required by the canons to avoid broaching any opinion diverse from what was received as orthodox or from the divine tradition of the fathers. In the ministration of sacraments and ordinances, the essential duties of the priesthood were considered to terminate. The invention of transubstantiation but increased the evil, and confirmed the clergy more than ever in their neglect of the work of evangelist. What need to preach the gospel of salvation when at any time the priest could offer up Christ anew as a real and sufficient atonement for sins? And so darkness grew on in the Middle Ages. Here and there we read of some attempts to revive preaching, as in England by King Alfred, and by Archbishop Egbert, Elfric, and Peckham. About 100 years later came Wycliffe. Regarding this neglect as the foulest treason to Christ, he not only himself set the example of preaching, but translated the Bible into English and sent forth poor priests for missionary work. As Wycliffe in England, so Huss in Bohemia. But both Huss and Wycliffe preachers were soon excommunicated as heretics and nearly suppressed by the terrors of the sword. And so this most important part of the Christian minister's duty, the addressing the hearts and consciences of the people from the word of life, the setting forth of God's grace and love through a dying, risen, and interceding Savior was again neglected, and all but unknown, until the close of the 15th century, and until Luther began the Reformation. At this very period, the word went forth, as from the angel to St. John, Thou must prophesy again, etc. It is true that at Luther's ordination as deacon, an old and primitive custom had been followed. The book of the Gospels, being placed in his hand by the bishop, he was charged thus, Take authority to read the Gospel in the Church of God. And words were added respecting his not only assisting the priests in the administration of the altar, but also of declaring the gospel and other scriptures of the New Testament and of preaching the word of God. Although afterwards, when ordained a priest, the patent and the chalice were given to him. 
and he was empowered to sacrifice, i.e. in private masses and the sacramental rite, for the living and the dead, a higher function generally thought to supersede the previous charge. Yet did he deeply feel his scriptural obligation to preach, what to him that the common practice was for the deacon to read a few words in an unknown tongue, had his priestly office annulled his deacon's vow? He felt not as others felt. Taught by the Spirit of God, he looked through the appointment by man to him in whose name he was ordained, and from his earliest call, and with but partial enlightenment from above, he recognized the duty and gave himself to the work of an evangelist, as one appointed even by the Lord Jesus himself. The Vicar General's order encouraged and confirmed him in his plan, and so the Church of Wittenberg, as before observed, heard the strange sound of revived gospel preaching. Luther not only preached, but he circulated evangelic writings and taught by personal communications. As a vicar general substitute, he held a visitation of the Augustine convents in electoral Saxony, and in this way was unconsciously preparing other monks and clergy to become preachers in the church soon to be established. No sooner did he discover the anti-Christian tendency of the restrictions relative to preaching, which we have noticed, than he set them aside. In his final letter to the Pope, he declares, there must be no fettering of scripture by rules of interpretation. The word of God must be left free. And both he and his brother reformers acted on the feeling. When Luther had proclaimed the papal oracle to be the voice of Antichrist and persisted at Worms before the emperor in rejecting it, the severest condemnatory decrees were issued against him and his fellow laborers. By these they were excommunicated from the Roman Church and degraded from their ministry in it, and on pain of confiscation of their goods, imprisonment, and even death, they were interdicted from preaching the gospel. Luther was outlawed, and his friend, the Elector of Saxony, to save his life hid him in a lonesome castle in the forest of Wartburg. In this remote solitude, he called his Patmos, he had time to reflect and to devise what could be done for the cause of the Church of Christ. Would he bow to the storm and abandon the work? Let us but follow out the apocalyptic figure. The voice said, Go, take the little book out of the angel's hand. Luther's chief occupation in his year of exile was translation of the New Testament into German. He felt this was needful to spread the light of truth among ministers and people, and for the overthrow of papal superstition. It was a work in which he delighted, and he expressed annoyance whenever controversial writing obliged a temporary interruption. He must be said to taste its sweetness, however bitter to him personally might be the immediate consequence of preaching it. It was now with him as with John the Revelator. When he ate the little book, he found it in his mouth sweet as honey. Thou must prophesy again. Full well did Luther feel that the gospel was still instrumentally the power of God unto salvation that to its long neglect was owing the establishment of the great apostasy, that by the renewed preaching of it, prophesying again, that apostate power was to be broken, and that on them who had been spiritually enlightened with divine truth devolved the obligation of accomplishing a reformation. Could the Pope annul his ministerial orders or alter the obligation consequent upon them? Could Antichrist cancel what Christ had communicated? Tracing upwards, Luther felt it was from Christ his commission had come, and that its revocation by the Pope was impossible. Nor could his deference to the powers that be move him on this point, so that the Emperor's interdict was ineffectual. 
confined in his Patmos, regardless of royal and papal orders against preaching, he wrote urging Melanchthon and his fellow servants forward and to continue to exercise their powers in evangelic preaching. It was the repetition of the angel's command, Thou must prophesy again. No sooner was the translation of the New Testament finished than he himself felt he could no longer remain silent. A crisis had arrived which seemed to call for his assistance. Persecution had begun against his fellow laborers in Germany, besides which a sect called Anabaptists had arisen, styling themselves Christians, but in truth bringing discredit on the name they professed. Melanchthon urged his return with a view to heading the little body of reformers in the fulfillment of their ministerial, it might be said, their apostolic commission. At the risk of his proscribed life, as if impelled by a voice from above, he returned to Wittenberg. In excuse, he wrote to his patron, the elector, the divine will is plain and leaves me no choice. The gospel is oppressed and begins to labor again. It is not from men I have received my commission, but from the Lord Jesus Christ. Henceforth, I wish to reckon myself his servant and to take the title of evangelist. In pursuing the history, we find how successful was the aid which Luther gave on his return, and how God opened the door for the spread of the gospel, whether by means of the translated word or by his preaching. It was in A.D. 1522 that Luther arrived in Wittenberg, and within two or three years, the message of salvation was heard by princes and people, not in Germany only, but in Sweden, Denmark, Pomerania, Livonia, in France, Belgium, Spain, and Italy also, though with less general acceptance, and last mention, but not least, in England. Preachers were raised up on every side, and translation of the scriptures were multiplied. The prediction was in course of fulfillment. Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And here occurred an important point for decision, and on which the continuance of this renewed evangelic preaching materially depended cut off from the ecclesiastical hierarchy, from whose hands were the ministers of the Reformation to receive ordination? Was the work so happily begun to cease for want of pastors? Surely not. Luther felt that where Scripture had not shut up the apostolic ministry of the early church by an express prohibition of other non-episcopal ordinations, the very necessity of the circumstances justified a departure from the usual practice. He renounced the title of priest and doctor given him by papal authorities and styled himself simply preacher, A.D. 1523. A year or two later, the function of ordination was formally taken into their own power by the Reformed churches. In the German churches, it was vested in superintendent presbyters, in the Swiss churches simply as the presbytery. On the other hand, in England, through God's providence, several of the bishops having united themselves with the Reformed Church, the regular medium of ordination was continued, all, however, in Christian fellowship with their Reformed sister churches on the continent. Of course, the want of direct Episcopal ordination in some cases and the previous excommunication of the ordaining bishops in others raised a cry amongst critics as if the Reformed Church had no regular ordination for its clergy. Regarding, however, this interpretation of the passage before us to be the right one, we have in the fact of St. John's being made the representative of the faithful ministers of the Reformation a direct intimation of their being all in the line of apostolic succession, and in the angel's words, Thou must prophesy again, of their being commissioned by him who commissioned the apostles, the covenant angel, 
the Lord Jesus. One remarkable change in the ritual of ordination was now introduced by the reformers. Instead of the words, Receive thou authority to sacrifice for the living and the dead, as was the Romish form, a solemn charge was given to preach the gospel. Preaching had been so long neglected that they must begin again the preaching of Christ. There was a change of the symbol too, as well as of words the presentation of chalice and patent being abolished, and instead thereof, in many churches, being substituted with the delivery of the New Testament, or perhaps of the whole Bible, now through the art of printing made a little book. The English ritual especially, in the authority presented to deacons and priests to read or to preach the word, and the injunction to the bishop to take heed to the doctrine, and to think on the things contained in this book may be said to perpetuate the apocalyptic commission. Surely the fact is remarkable, nor would it be uninteresting for such as are ordained to remember this pre-enactment of their ordination in the visions of Patmos. They might not only thus derive strength and comfort in the consciousness of a direct divine commission, but, moreover, be wholesomely impressed with the duty of making the gospel the grand subject both of their personal study and of their public preaching, and of maintaining a constant and faithful testimony against all superstition, sin, and error, especially against those of the apostate Church of Rome. Lecture 18, The Covenant Angels' Commission, Part 2. The latter part of the Covenant Angels' Charge is contained in that which appears in our Bibles as the first verse of chapter 11, but which is evidently a continuation of the same scene as that which the 10th chapter closes the same angel continuing to speak to St. John and giving him a further direction. The temple, which we have already shown to represent the Christian church, is again introduced with a new feature superadded, its outer court, or court of the Gentiles. The altar court is still used as the symbol of that part of the visible church which faithfully adhered to the true worship indicated by the altar, while the outer court, which under the former dispensation was given to such heathen as professed Judaism, but too often apostatized, is now applied to represent those who, while they profess Christianity, had virtually adopted an idolatrous worship. It would seem almost impossible for the apostle not to view in these outer court worshippers that line of apostasy described in earlier visions, which in one scene, under the name of Christ Israel, had been satisfied with another life-giving, another sealing than that of the angel of life, which in another is described as forsaking the great altar of sacrifice, and again as rejecting Christ's reconciliation and adopting other mediators, and yet once more, when the third part of men had been slain, as continuing in demon worship and heathen idolatry, that line against whose head the cry of the angel had gone forth in majestic wrath, and from whose seven-hilled metropolis had issued forth, in defiance of it, the seven anti-Christian thunders. This premise, the meaning of the clause will readily approve itself. St. John, representing at this epoch the Reformed Church, was desired to rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. These four several points would seem to be signified. One, that Luther and his brother laborers were directed, as from heaven, to a reconstitution of the Reformed Church, 
for the measuring implies the edification and constitution as well as definition of what is measured. Two, that they should define as the proper members of the church such only as in public profession recognize the doctrine of justification through the alone efficacy of the propitiatory sacrifice of Christ and through Christ's alone mediatorship. Three, that the Romish church must thence be excluded or excommunicated as apostate and heathen. Four, that for this purpose a certain ecclesiastical authority would be officially given to them. It being said, there was given me a reed like unto a rod. The more frequent use of the word rod in the New Testament is as the ensign of official authority. On two occasions, when the Jewish temple worship had become corrupt and needed reform, under the reigns of Hezekiah and Josiah, it was the royal mandate that empowered the priesthood to carry out the purification. The original call was, of course, from God, but it was the regal authority which immediately enforced the act. Agreeably with these precedents, in a reed like unto a rod, which was given to St. John, was shadowed forth the support which Luther and his fellow reformers would meet with from the royal and other ruling powers of those times. And now for the historical fulfillment of this part of the vision. March 1522, upon leaving the castle of Wartburg to resume his ministerial labors, despite the interdicts of Pope and Emperor, the established religion in Saxony was still the Roman Catholic. Nor did Luther at that time wish for much more than the liberty of preaching the gospel, expecting that this in itself would be sufficient for the overthrow of error, and that consequently the papacy would fall to ruins. The measuring rod had not yet been officially given to the reformers to authorize their reconstitution of the church, but it soon became evident that some plan of ecclesiastical discipline must be observed for the proper ordering of the reformed services the prevention of possible divisions, and the general support of religion. Luther's personal influence was, as yet, the only visible cement of union. He had appropriated to the maintenance of the ministers, hospitals, and schools the revenues of certain old canonries of Wittenberg lately become vacant. Still authority was wanted. After another year, the elector Frederick, convinced that the Reformation was accordant with God's will, determined to give the required sanction. But before it was done, he died. His brother and successor, the elector John, assuming that supremacy in ecclesiastical matters was the right of every lawful sovereign, as maintained by the reformers alike in Germany, Switzerland, and England, proceeded at once to exercise that right by forming new ecclesiastical constitutions. New forms of worship were introduced, drawn up by Luther and Melanchthon on scriptural principles. Romish images and superstitions were removed. The ecclesiastical revenues of the electorate were appropriated to the support of the Reformed religion, and a fresh supply of ministers received their ordination altogether independent of the Roman hierarchy, about A.D. 1525. Soon after, a general visitation of the electorate by Luther and other reforming fathers was made on the prince's order, to see to the execution of the new system and to complete the establishment of a separate evangelical church. The example was followed by the ruling powers in the reforming states of Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and soon England. And here let us notice that the principle acted upon in them was precisely that which was laid down by the angel in vision for the measurement of the apocalyptic temple, to make salvation through Christ's meritorious death and mediatorship, that which the Jewish altar symbolized, the prominent characteristic of reformed worship, and to exclude those who, forsaking that altar, had made 
to themselves another method of salvation and given themselves to heathen superstitions and idolatries, in other words, the votaries of the false Church of Rome. Charged by the Romanists as schismatical, the principle was solemnly avowed and justified. At the first Diet of Augsburg, A.D. 1525, a defense or apology written by Melanchthon was presented by the elector, in which the following points were insisted on. First, that every minister of God's word is bound by Christ's express precept to preach the leading doctrine of the gospel, justification by faith in Christ crucified and not by the merit of human performances. Whereas men had by the Roman doctrine been drawn from the cross of Christ to trust in their own works and in various superstitious vanities. Second, that it became the princes, to whom authority rightly belonged, to consider whether the new doctrines were or were not true, and if true, to protect and promote them. Third, that the Pope, cardinals, and clergy did not constitute the Church of Christ, albeit there were some apparently amongst them who opposed the prevailing errors and really belonged to the true Church the latter consisting of the faithful and none else, who had the word of God and by it were sanctified and cleansed, while on the other hand, what St. Paul had predicted of Antichrist coming and sitting in the temple of God had its fulfillment in the papacy, which being so, and God having forbidden, under the heaviest penalty, every species of idolatry and false worship of which class were the sacrifice of the mass, masses for the dead, invocations of saints, and such like, things notoriously taught in the Church of Rome. The reformers were not guilty of schism in having convicted Antichrist of his errors, or in making alterations in their church worship and regulations, whereby Romish superstitions were cast out. Such was the manifesto of the reformers to the first Diet of Augsburg. In the second Diet, A.D. 1530, the celebrated articles and confessions of faith were presented to the same effect. These and other confessions, which were elsewhere adopted, differed, as might be expected in some non-essential matters, but they agreed in all the main points but they agreed on all main points, the preaching of the gospel being charged on their ministers, justification by faith in Christ being held forth as the only true method of salvation, and a separation from the Romish church being indispensable. Bearing in mind that all this wonderful and blessed consummation was being effected just at the period of that memorable scene the papal triumph at Rome, described in a former lecture. Let us observe how every point of triumph displayed by the usurper was met and counteracted by him whose place he had so usurped. The Bible, condemned to be shut up, was now translated, printed, and circulated. The gospel, forbidden to be preached, was now freed from all the glosses of the priests, proclaimed by hundreds. The Pope himself was openly declared to be Antichrist, which name he had forbidden to be named, and the day of judgment was held forth as a day fixed and coming, when his reign and power would terminate. As he too had excommunicated the reformers, the true followers of Christ, so was he and his whole religious system and retainers now cast out of the real church. The wretched Leo lived not to see the separation accomplished, as we have described, but he lived to hear his bull against Luther met with the stern defiance by this champion of truth. As they curse and excommunicate me for the holy verity of God, so do I curse and excommunicate them. Let Christ judge between us, whose excommunication, his or mine, shall stand approved before him. 
he lived to see the failure of every means set in order to stop the progress of the Reformation. It remained for his successors to see this great revolution ecclesiastically and politically accomplished, a pledge of what yet awaits the papacy when he that shall come will come, and by the brightness of his coming at once totally and forever destroy the man of sin and his whole kingdom.